All right, ready? Great, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time to come down and the first lunch and learn of the new season, I think, and the first one to be filmed. So welcome <laughs> to anyone watching on YouTube as well. Yes, the media train is gone. Yes. Uh, luckily for you, you're not actually going to hear very much from me today. I'm just here to introduce the session and then pass over to you, Anne and Kerry, who are going to do the bulk of the talking. Um, and then we'll all kind of chip in with any questions uh, that you might have at the end, if you have any. Uh, we're going to try and cover three things, basically. We're going to start off, um, Kerry's going to talk to you about the results of the Assembly election in May, uh, some of which I'm sure you already know, but a little bit about the implications that we see for aged Cymru and older people as well. Uh, we're going to then go segue neatly from that, hopefully, into talking about the three priorities for the public affairs team for uh, this year. Um, that's quite linked to the assembly election and they're the main things we're going to be talking to politicians about. And then uh, we're going to cover at the end because although it wasn't originally planned that we talk about the EU referendum in this lunch and learn, uh, it obviously has a massive implication on a lot of the policy work of the organisation moving forward, we imagine, though the theme of that slide you'll soon see is uncertainty. Um, so, okay, at that stage I'll pass over to Kerry uh, to come and do the first part of the presentation. Right, we'll just do um, a quick recap of the um, Assembly election 2016 results. So uh, Labour is the largest party and they formed a minority government led by First Minister Cadwyn Jones. And they hold 29 seats out of the 60 seats at the Assembly, so they're down one seat from the last election. So Plaid Cymru is the official um, opposition party and they've gained one seat and they hold a total of 12 seats. Welsh Conservatives are down three seats and they hold a total of 11 seats. And UKIP for the first time at the Assembly has seven seats, elected through the regional list vote. And the Welsh Liberal Democrats, they lost four seats and they just have the one seat now held by Kirsty Williams. And it's quite interesting that she's been appointed into Carwyn Jones' cabinet as Secretary for Education. So what does this mean for H. Cymru? Well, we're building relationships with um, AMs and we're holding meetings with them. And also we provide them with written briefings when sort of older people's issues sort of come up at plenary. And the idea is that we raise the profile of older people's issues and Age Cymru at the Senedd. And it gives us an opportunity, as Graham said, to promote our priority um, issues, which we'll come on to a bit later. And it's interesting that with a minority government, it's possible that the Welsh Government may have more difficulty in getting legislation passed. So this could really provide a key role for charities such as Age Cymru and others to sort of influence when various issues come up at plenary and also through the committees, the assembly committees, and we have been invited to give evidence of those in the past. Um, Mike Hedges, the um, AM, is looking to set up a cross-party group on older people and ageing. And the idea of the, the cross-party group is that um, various sort of assembly members with an interest in older people's issues gives them an opportunity to sort of come together and discuss um, issues affecting older people. And Age Cymru provides a secretariat for that. We'll also be holding an older people's question time in September. And there again we'll have the spokespeople on older people's issues from the various parties at the assembly. And there'll be a, a chance for older people to ask some questions. And we're also holding an event at the Senedd in December, promoting age-friendly Wales. And some of you may be familiar with our Envisage journal, um, but for, for those of you who are not, it's more of a, it's like a discussion journal, and that we get um, experts from their fields to contribute various articles, so it's very much about sharing good practice. And this issue is going to be focusing on age-friendly communities and cities. And then we've got articles on things like the accessibility of the built environment in our communities. We've got one on um, sort of housing options for older people. And we've got a, an article on transport, which really is, sort of, is so important in underpinning older people being able to access all various services. And we're quite lucky that at, the, um, at this event, we've got Dr. Charles Musselwhite from Swansea University, 
who wrote the article on transport, and he, he'll be at the um, event giving a presentation. So all of these, sort of all of the above really give us an you know, opportunity to promote our priority issues with Assembly members, and we come on to those now. Okay, uh, you do get to hear from me again. Um, basically, this is our first priority, first of three, all are linked under the Age Friendly Wales um, banner. Um, and this one will be led by Roseanne, who couldn't be here today. Um, so essentially, it's a continuation of a lot of work Age Cymru has done over the last few years around care um, as a fundamental priority of older people in Wales, always coming up very strongly whenever we uh, talk to older people, looking at the kinds of queries we get through the information and advice services and that local partners deal with as well. So it is always likely to be a high priority for Age Cymru. Um, over the last few years, we have been very focused at the Senedd when working on this issue because of the a couple of really substantial pieces of legislation that the last Welsh Government put through the Assembly and that have been passed over the last couple of years. Uh, the theme for us now is to move from being so politically focused at the Assembly to being uh, more outwardly campaigning around some of these issues and outwardly talking to our partners and to older people about the impact that that legislation is having in reality. Um, we're very supportive of a lot of the aims of the Welsh Government's legislation. Um, it is very, I think, unclear how some of those things will play out in reality, particularly when combined with shrinking budgets at a local level um, when almost all of the the stuff in the legislation will need to be implemented by local authorities. Um, I think that's a, that's a key challenge. So we're going to be uh, developing on from our legislative work to do some more campaigning and policy work in the community, uh, particularly monitoring how that legislation works in practice, uh, gathering data and local intelligence from partners and our information advice service as much as we can uh, to really see whether um, you know, the aspirations of the Welsh Government and the politicians in passing the legislation are actually being met in practice and crucially I think to see where local variations exist because there is still quite a lot of freedom being allowed to local government in different areas of Wales to do things in a different way um, despite some of the initial rhetoric that some of you may remember about a national eligibility criteria for services for example what, what we think came out of legislation is not what we might have foreseen as being a national eligibility criteria. So crucial for us, I think, in playing a national role and telling that story back to politicians um, and involving the public in that as much as we can. Um, so Roseanne is currently looking at how we go about collecting that information and how we transform it into a narrative that we can then you know, speak publicly about in the press or speak to campaigning groups, um, speak to older people about. Um, and we'll be looking to to progress that over the coming months. Yeah, so um, another priority is, is um, loneliness and, and socialized, uh, social isolation um, among older people. And we're going to be developing the policy and campaign resources on loneliness and social isolation in line with the other organisation-wide activities that, that's obviously going on here. So the sort of areas that we'll be looking at are things like, as I kind of spoke earlier on about the links to transport, which is so important, enabling sort of older people to access all kinds of services. Things like the built environment, is it accessible, you know, are people able to be able to get out in the communities, that sort of thing. And again, the access to services, which I've, I've touched on. And we're also going to be considering where government policy decisions may have impacts on loneliness and isolation. And an area that Roseanne is going to be doing, and she's going to be looking at the context of pressures in health and social isolation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this takes us to priority three, which is scams. Uh, we've been working on scams as a priority area for about three or four years now, since uh, we launched the Scams and Swindles campaign. And basically, um, it's a big problem. Only 5% of scams go reported. Uh, we know that in 2011-12 there were 2,500 scams reported in Wales, so we're looking at massive numbers of scams going unreported. So it's a hidden problem. All the people on average who were scammed lose £1,200. 
and if you're scammed once, you're more likely to be scammed again. There are four different types of scam. Broadly speaking, you've got doorstep scams, which is uh, rope builders turn up and say, no, you've got a loose slate on your roof, I can fix it for you. Starts at 50 quid, they go up on your roof, oh, be 300 quid, and by the end of the day, they found something wrong with your chimney, and they're charging you 10,000 pounds. So that's a classic doorstep scam. Postal scams, uh, letters arriving in the post saying you've won a massive amount of money in a lottery you never entered, um, send away your administration fee and uh, to secure you, your winnings. That's a classic scam. Telephone scams, where people ring up uh, claiming to be from Microsoft, saying there's a scam, or that there's a virus on your computer. If you can give us access to your computer, we can get rid of that virus for you. What they then do is put malware on your computer and they blackmail you uh, into handing over. I've heard of cases of people losing £300 to telephone scams like that and online scams which can be you know anything viruses on emails which go into your computer steal your personal data um, so I mean romantic scams I was looking recently there's been an upsurge in, in people being ripped off with uh, online dating sites but anyway it's a big problem and so that's what the Scams and Swindles campaign is setting out to do is to introduce more protection for older people against scams now the second point on this slide is the Wales Against Scams Partnership, now or WASP as it's known. WASP is an initiative that Age Cymru was uh, responsible for setting up as part of the Scams and Swindles campaign. Now what WASP is, it's got 16 members so far, there's big players uh, who are part of WASP, uh, Trading Standards, Scams Team, Barclays, British Gas, these are all companies who and organisations who realise that the people they work with are prone to potentially being scammed. So we've got a, a, a fantastic reach uh, in terms of influence with, with the organisations involved with uh, WASP. There are two new police forces joining soon, North Wales Police and David Powys Police. Uh, so WASP is a very exciting development and Age Cymru has been at the forefront of, of making that happen. Now the third point on there is related to WASP, it's no cold calling zones. No cold calling zones or um, cold calling control zones are streets or areas of towns and cities where cold calling is discouraged. Um, so basically that means that people living in those streets are protected in a way from the rogue traders. And one of the things we were calling for under the Scams and Swindles campaign was Wales to, to be made one big no cold calling zone. Uh, that is an ambitious target. Um, we've been lobbying Westminster and the Welsh Government. There seems to be, it, it's a local government related matter. But in conversations with Cardiff Bay, Cardiff Bay doesn't seem too keen to be taking on that responsibility. They keep passing it back to Westminster, so we can't really make it's been difficult making any progress with that. But through WASP, um, there's been an exciting development that is kind of like a no call calling zone where South Wales Police uh, and other organisations are going to be sending out stickers uh, for people to put on the houses saying no cold callers here. Now that's been done before, but what you tend to have is just one house in the street. If you live in Cardiff, the worst kept secret in Cardiff is those orange diamond stickers on bins basically says someone physically frail lives here and they need help with their bins. So in the past, possibly, no call calling, uh, no call caller stickers have been seen as a kind of uh, indicator that someone potentially vulnerable lives in a house in a particular street. Well, this new initiative that we're part of with South Wales Police is going to be doing is asking everyone to put no call calling stickers up in the windows. So when you go to a street, in effect, it is a no call calling zone. So that's an exciting development that we're going to be, uh, South Wales Police are launching it on the 8th of September. So uh, I think that's, I think we can claim through the work that's been done with WASP that that is a win, basically. We haven't quite got the call calling zones as we wanted them, but what we have in effect with the introduction of this campaign on the September the 8th is the concept of a call calling zone being introduced in streets right across South Wales. So... That's the scams work uh, that we've been working on.
The next thing is the vessel. This is what you've all been waiting for, okay? <laughs> Brexit and the implications for older people of the Brexit vote. Uh, and as Graham said, the key theme here is uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty, unknowns at the moment about uh, Brexit. Um, there's been so many comings and going, it's difficult to keep a, a track on what's actually happening. But Age Cymru, we, we are working closely with Age UK, because Age UK has, tends to have the, the Westminster policy brief, so they are the ones who tend to deal in the main with uh, the politicians of Westminster. We're working closely with Age UK now to try and establish potential implications for all the people uh, in the UK, or, or the UK leaving the EU. And in the future, we will be working closely with them, continuing to work closely with Age UK to make sure that our policy lines um, are reflecting the impact of any changes on all the people of the UK potentially leaving the EU. That concludes our presentation, so we're going to take some questions. I'm going to switch the camera off as well.